So, Dr. Carl, this morning we have a very special guest with us. He's on our shores, Dave from Glass Animals. Dave, welcome to Science with Dr. Carl. I'm so excited to be here. So, you're a fan of the pod, I will say. How did you get across Science with Dr. Carl? Well, every time we've come to Australia, I've heard whispers of Dr. Carl. You hear the name. It kind of floats in the in the ether <laughs> of Australia. And uh, I looked it up. I've been listening to the, the podcast and I'm so I, the opportunity came up to be on it. And I was like, what? Uh, yes. Sign and me up. You have a stack of questions that you have prepared for Dr. Yep. Carl. Yeah. So I do. Carl, are you ready to get into these? Ready to rock. I've had the look at the questions in advance. I've done my homework. I'm ready to rock. Yeah, oh okay. my God. This Dave? Because I've been, I need these questions answering. Uh, answering? Answering. First question. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Yep. Let's go. What if gravity didn't exist? Well, firstly, there'd be nothing heavier in terms of elements than hydrogen and helium. Oh, yeah. Wow. Because they're manufactured in stars and the stars are drawn together by gravity. Let me give you a philosophical point of view. There's a book by Martin Rees called Just Six Numbers. Yeah. And another one by Geraint Lewis called A Fortunate Universe. And it looks at what would happen if the certain constants, like the fine structure constant or pi, were just a little tiny bit different. And in the vast majority of the universes that play out, there ain't no life. So it is possible to have a universe in which there'd be no gravity, and gravity goes back to John Wheeler. Mass tells space how to curve, comma, and curved space tells mass where to go. So the first thing is there'd be no stars. There'd Whoa. be no heavy elements. If, if there was an Earth, it would immediately explode if the gravity were to stop because there's this outward pressure. There'd be no atmosphere on any of the planets, but there'd be no planets because there'd be nothing from the gravity point of view of bringing things together. You'd only have the electromagnetic force the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, but there'd be no gravity. Whoa. And then that, that, that of course, ignores dark matter and dark energy. Yeah. (laughs) That's another (laughs) another subject. So nothing would exist. Well, it'd be a different universe. Yeah. Because why should we think that the life that exists is only you and me? I have read too much science fiction and slightly damaged my brain. So I tend to think that stars could be living creatures in the sense that they've Mm. got electrons. Yeah. Electrons can spin this way and that way. And this way and that way is like one and naught in a computer. And a computer can mimic or be intelligent. And so in that way, a star could be a living creature. And we would exist on a lifespan so small, we wouldn't realize that it was alive like a bacteria on your skin doesn't realize that you're alive. I, I told you I read too much science fiction. <laughs> that is not too much science fiction. That's blown my mind. And it sort of leads me into a question that comes up later, which is, do aliens exist? Yes and no. At the moment, we've got zero proof whatsoever. We have five places within our solar system where we have underground oceans of water. Mars, wow. and then two moons of Jupiter, uh, Ganymede and Europa, and two moons of Saturn, Titan and Enceladus. Now, Enceladus is a big one because when Cassini spacecraft came into orbit around Enceladus, it sort of ran into a whole lot of like insects at sunset, you know, pop, 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 these little particles, and they ignored them because the big thing was the rings of Saturn and Titan. No. And then they went back and looked at the records and they thought, what we've been running into are rocks, uh, are things, four to 16 nanometers in size. And, okay. and they said, oh, from hydrothermal vents. Now, you know about hydrothermal vents? They, they happen at the sea floor? Exactly. So yeah. the, there's this mountain range, which is the biggest mountain range on Earth. Yeah. Um, 80,000 kilometers long, and you'll never see it because the base is about four and a half kilometers down, and the top is about two kilometers down. Wow. Is that a Mariana Trench? Oh, that, yeah. That, that, no, that's the Oceanic that's Ridge. One. Wow. Winding around the Earth like a seam on a tennis ball. And at cool. 500 places where the Earth is pulling apart, tectonic plate activity, yeah. there's hot water coming out. And yeah. the hot water is up, the temperature is up to 460 degrees C. And that water, the energy supplies the energy needed to run a life system, and the elements coming out are the elements of life. And so you've got these 500 or so ecosystems, which are like there's weird creatures down there like worms, the diameter of your leg and two meters long without a mouth or an anus. What? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. The the way they live is like, imagine that you had a transparent panel on your tummy and Uh you'd lie out in the sunlight and get photosynthesis happening. It's kind of equivalent to that. So you wouldn't need them. It's my dream. Like a Teletubby. (laughs) So so what we did was we found, (laughs) so there's there's strong evidence that there's hydrothermal vents on Enceladus because the water's coming out at 200 kilometers a second. 
um, uh, 200 kilograms a second. And then uh, last week it was announced we found some more particles that had a frequency size range of around 120 and 220 nanometers, which is the size range of two bacteria that live on hydrothermal vents. So do we oh. have any proof there's life? None. Do we have suggestions? Yes. Dave, do you believe aliens exist? I, I do. But then I, ha I had dinner with someone the other day who was like, it is incredibly, they said that the, uh, they were a mathematician and had a mathematical argument up to why they don't exist oh. because life forming is so incredibly unlikely that even if you kind of extrapolated it, yeah, if and, and the Fermi paradox, infinite universes, it still wouldn't. Yeah, you look up the Fermi paradox on Wikipedia, and that gives a really good summary. So in 1950, Enrico Fermi, you know the yeah. physicist, he's sitting at lunch with a whole bunch of other really clever physicists, and then out of the blue, he says, "Where are they?" That simple sentence, and everybody knows what he's talking about. Where are the aliens? If the universe is that big and there are that many stars and that many planets and that many that, that, that amount of time, where are they? I mean, that sort of brings me to another question. How long do we have left? Um, Humans. You're talking the extinction of uh, life, yeah. and there's a whole bunch of different things there. So on one hand, you're looking at external natural events. Yeah. And so in 2015 on Halloween, the Halloween asteroid came past and it missed us by roughly the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Oh, that's not was, so much. That, that's not much. And it was 600 metres in diameter, which by coincidence is uh, the diameter of my planet. Oh, Dave, do you have your own planet? Do you Named have a planet? Oh, did you mention? Oh, darling. Yes, of course. Oh, what? Oh, yeah. 18412 Krishnitsky. How do you get one? Oh, <laughs> you got to have friends. So, <laughs> you just went there and put your flag in it. Well, no, but it's in the asteroid belt at 600 metres in diameter. It's wow. between Mars and Jupiter. But if it had hit the Earth, depending on where it hit, either the dead heart, dead geological heart of Australia or the middle of the Pacific Ocean or the middle of Antarctica, it would have killed between 30 and 60% of all humans. And we, if we'd had three years warning, Whoa. we could have done something about it. We had three weeks. <gasps> Right, wow. So we need to become a space-going race. So will humans survive? Definitely. We're not going to make it past a billion years okay. on Earth yes. because then the surface temperature will be 100 degrees C. Right. And almost wow. certainly we will evolve into something. So uh, can I recommend more homework for you? Read the book by Freeman Dyson, uh, Disturb the Universe, where he reckons the proper shape for a human is a cloud of iron vapor, the diameter of a planet, 50 kilograms floating through space and navigating. And very importantly, you can still have sex because, as you know, the greatest philosopher of all time, Frank Zappa, said, Oh, yeah. Your main sexual organ is your brain, mm. not all the squishy colored bits. It's your brain. And so if you've got a brain, you can have sex. And so th th that rests your worries about being able to survive as a cloud of iron vapor. So I reckon we'll still survive, but we won't necessarily be this carbon based yeah, meat yeah. bag that evolution has left us with. Wow. But we've got to get past these short-term things like climate change and l lack of biodiversity and the coral reefs going and all that sort of stuff. And we can do that. There's enough money in the world to do it. It just needs to be in the right place. I mean, that's actually quite a hopeful answer. Mm. I thought you might have said, you know, <laughs> we got a, we got a year. Um, <laughs> I, uh, one thing I've learned is that optimism will get you through a bad situation better than non-optimism. Definitely. Yeah, so if yeah. you're optimistic, even if it's irrational, you still end up feeling a bit better. <laughs> oh, like, yeah, I know the world's gone to shit, but I, I know it's <laughs> 11 o'clock at night, honey, but if I don't get a good night's sleep, I'll be crap tomorrow and the world will still be the same, so at least mm. I can get a good night's sleep. That's a good, I'm going to take that, like, with me yeah. forever. That's so good. Um, it, entropy. Entropy. I think it's a f it's, it sucks. Entropy what is, is entropy? like this law that everything goes towards chaos like but if the opposite were true like why is that true what, what like so when you like drop your coffee it splatters everywhere and it goes all over. but if if entropy didn't exist you might drop your coffee and it would just stay in the cup and balance perfectly or you could walk oh. through a field and then yeah. the various atoms would come together to make the cup and the atoms of hydrogen and oxygen yeah. and the caffeine molecules and then spontaneously form themselves into a cup of coffee by the time you walked out of that field. <laughs> yeah. Why isn't that true? It could be. Uh, as I said, a fortunate universe by Grant Lewis <gasps> and just six numbers. There are an infinity of alternative universes and in one of them, entropy could go backwards. So what we've got is that we're heading towards maximum disorder. 
So, yeah. uh, so energy comes into a system and uh, a lot of that energy is used to do something, but then some of it goes away as heat. And we're heading towards inexorably what's called the heat death of the universe. Why, would it, why, why do we have entropy? It's just the luck of the draw in the universe that we happen to be in. And Bad could luck of the draw. Mm, I'm, I'm alive. I've got friends. That's, That's not bad true. luck. That's you know? true. <laughs> I've got very narrow boundaries. Uh, <laughs> and, and so we could have a universe in which entropy went the other way. Like, you know how they've, they've probably lied to you about this. They've, they've told you about the conservation of energy. Yeah. You know, that's a lie. Oh, is it? Yeah. Co en energy is conserved only in a stationary universe. Ooh. Be but we have a universe that's expanding. Now, imagine you get a rope between here and a distant galaxy. And then that distant galaxy is going to escape away at about 70 kilometers per second for every million parsecs or, you know, you know Hubble expansion, right? That rope will try to get longer. Yeah. So you can get energy out of it. Oh. Energy is constant only in a stationary universe and we're not in a stationary universe. So our understanding is like a child on a beach picking up a shell and saying, oh, I understand everything there is to know about marine life. <laughs> yeah. Right, and there's this whole energy out there. And, of course, as we know from those fun, wonderful movies, uh, Meg is still underwater. <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. Dave, you've got a question about one of your pet peeves, so to speak. I have a pet peeve about bad breath. I don't know why. I just do. Pe bad breath gets me. So, Dr. Carl, what's the best way to get rid of Is there a way to do it? And I think maybe breath. this stems from having a dog. <laughs> Ah, who has okay. some bad breath, I, but also humans. Okay, I became aware of it when my little daughter Alice was five years old and she came into bed and said, Daddy, Daddy, I love you very much, followed immediately by, Hey, Daddy, did you know that you smell like a bum? <laughs> what? I, as a scientist, me. wanted confirmation, so I rolled over and asked my wife, Do I smell like a bum? And she went, Yep, you smell like a bum. And that got me interested in the concept of bad breath. And the world expert on bad breath is Mel Rosenberg, who started off in 1990 and then by the year 2002 managed to get an article on bad breath in the Scientific American. And he sort of started off the field. And bad breath is overwhelmingly caused by your mouth, 85%. 5% of the time your nose, you've got bad things up your nose. There was a case oh. of, of a woman who had shoved a little Barbie part up her nose <laughs> and oh, yeah. stayed there for years. Um, tonsils, you know, every time now, now and then you sneeze and you put your hand in front of your mouth to catch it and you see these little tiny spots about two millimetres in diameter. They're tonsillolith, lith being a stone. And then you can have weird things like trimethyl amonuria where you smell like a fish. But overwhelmingly, it's the bacteria in your mm -hmm. mouth. What you can do about it is have good dental hygiene, brush your teeth yeah. and your gums and use an electric toothbrush that monitors where you are so that way you can obey your new robot overlord and keep your teeth all <laughs> nice and clean. Um, and then uh, uh, water, stay hydrated because te mm -hmm. people who talk a lot like radio announcers and politicians mm. and school teachers are blowing air over their tongue all oh, the time. Oh, like feeding and, it? Yeah, and, and, and they're drying. The mm. They're drawing the water, so different bacteria form. So each night you go to sleep, That's a whole breath. different bunch of bacteria pop into existence because they've got a life cycle of 20 minutes. And there's a whole bunch of stinky ones in the morning. And then by the time you've had a few drinks, they go away, and then it goes like that. And also brush Whoa. your tongue. Brushing mm. your tongue is a good thing. Okay. And, but, and, and people say things like avoid stinky foods like garlic. I love garlic. I, if everybody had garlic, nobody would complain. So, Dave, <laughs> you've got to brush your dog's tongue. I've got to brush saying. Woody's tongue. Ooh, He's going to hate that. Can you? I, I, if space is a vacuum. Uh, and I was wondering if you could propel yourself. If you really had to, you're stuck in space. If you could just fart and <laughs> move yourself towards the spaceship. Luckily, we've actually done the experiment. You did it yourself? <laughs> no, I haven't been in space. But the astronaut Chris Hadfield had tried using farts for propulsion on the International Space Station. And he said, and I quote, he found it. Too muffled, comma, with not the right type of propulsive nozzle, unquote. So you do get oh a very small God. motion, which if you fart, you'll be moving yourself at roughly one thousandth the rate at which your hair grows. Okay. And you can't aim it all that well. But yes, theoretically, <laughs> you if you've got enough time, nozzle. you can propulse, you propel yourself around <laughs> by using farts. I'm so glad that the scientists got all the way to space and decided to do that. <laughs> That makes me so happy. And play music as well. What oh, was the yeah. song? Uh, Ground Control to Master Tom. He did that one. Perfect yeah. choice. Done. Perfect choice. Dave from Glass Animals, thank you so much for joining us. 
for this special edition of Science with Dr. Carl. How does it feel to have access to this man for all these questions? I feel like I've learned a lifetime of knowledge in about 20 minutes. It's overwhelming. I've made notes. I'm, I feel really blessed. Well, Thank you. I, I, after the 2020 uh, Hottest 100, I, f- I love your song, which has got a curiously sort of lyrical feel and combines a mixture of existential angst, like you'd be better off with somebody else, as well as some <laughs> science and uh, geography telling us that the hottest part of the world is in, you must be in the Northern Hemisphere because it's hot in June, as well yes. as you refer to the fake water across the road. And I thought, yeah. oh my God, this has got science and art and, and, and a broken heart all in one song and an existential angst. What's not to like? No wonder it came number one in the hottest 100. Oh, I'm glad someone finally noticed all that existential <laughs> angst. I'm glad. No, I, I, I'm glad someone saw science in it. Finally, I've always wanted to be a scientist, but I fell into this music thing by accident. Oh, yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank woo-hoo! you, Dr. Carr. I've re- I enjoyed that so much. Yay! And I've got lots of things to read. 